April, and the king is finally deposed. After Jupiter's domination of the winter skies, we begin spring with a new pretender to the crown in the shape of perhaps astronomy's ultimate tease, Mars. Questions of life, the only planet with visible surface detail, unpredictable global dust storms and those ever-changing ice caps combine with an orbital period that doesn't give us an opposition every year and doesn't give us a close opposition very often. And that's a real shame because Mars is one of those planets that has so much detail and intrigue to tease out that it can be quite frustrating that it's not looming as large as the moon in an amateur telescope. Yes, and because Mars is about 150 times further away than the Moon, it's always smaller than you remember, but April this year still belongs to the God of War, and more on that later. This month we also have a decent meteor shower, and for those listeners in North America, there's a total lunar eclipse to look forward to. But we start with this month's Beginner's Guide, and we follow that up with a galaxy quest and star-splitting challenge as we tour around the often overlooked constellation of Buertes. But first, it's over to Ralph. Thanks, Paul. So, for the Beginner's Guide this month, we'll take a look at one of the most famous and useful constellations in the sky, Ursa Major, or the Great Bear. Famous because it has within it seven stars that are recognisable to almost everyone, young and old. Known in North America as the Big Dipper, in Asia as the Northern Ladle, and in Europe as the Plough or the Saucepan. It's not hard to see why it gained these colloquial names. And it's useful because it serves to locate so many points in the sky. The two stars at the opposite end of the plough to the handle, Merak and Dube, are known as the pointer stars because they point to the pole star that sits practically at true north. And this will be the first port of call for anyone using an equatorial mount, so they can get a polar alignment before they begin observing. Following the curve of the handle of the plough away from the saucepan's bowl traces an arc to the bright star Arcturus and the constellation of Buertes. Following that arc further, takes us to the star Spica and the constellation of Virgo. Ursa Major is a far larger constellation than just the Plough Asterism, but we'll stick with these seven stars in this guide as it's all we need to make our way around it. And we'll start with the easiest binary of them all to split. For this you'll need look no further than the star in the kink of the handle, Mizar. Even in the most light polluted skies, those with good vision will be able to see it as two distinct stars, Mizar and Alcor with the naked eye. But Ursa Major is probably just as famous for the galaxies it contains. And as they're all in our local supercluster, they're close enough to be simply stunning in the eyepiece and can be seen in dark skies relatively easily with even a 4-inch scope. Although M101, the pinwheel galaxy, does have a low surface brightness, so you may have to use averted vision to pick that one out unless you use a 6-inch scope or larger. But it's well worth looking for M101 as it's a grand spiral galaxy like our own and it's face on so we get to see its lovely spiral arms. Just draw a line between Mizar and Alcade, the stars at the end of the plough's handle. If it were an equilateral triangle with the third corner pointing to the left, that corner is where M101 sits. Now draw a line between Alcade and Cor Caroli in the constellation Canis Venatici to the right of Ursa Major, and about a quarter of the way along that line, and roughly half a degree above that point, sits another unique wonder for amateur astronomers, Messier 51, the Whirlpool Galaxy. So named because you see a face-on spiral galaxy devouring another smaller galaxy that strayed too close. It's visible in a 4-inch scope, but the view through an 8-inch scope will blow your mind. And where else can you see something as awe-inspiring as two galaxies colliding with your own eyes from your own garden? Now to complete the list of easily viewed galaxies in Ursa Major, move up the Big Dipper to the lower left star in the bowl, Fad or Fecta. Draw a line from that star to the last star in the bowl, Dubi. Continue that line to the left for the same distance and you get a 2 for 1, because that's where a slanted spiral galaxy, M81, sits within the same low power eyepiece view as the Edgeon galaxy, home to the recent supernova, M82, and gravitational interactions between the two galaxies set off rapid star formation in M82, and all of the galaxies I've suggested here will merge with our own galaxy in billions of years' time. Now let's turn to the solar system and see what is available for your eyepieces and imaging kit this month. First off, we need to talk about Mars. Finally, after a long absence, Mars is properly back in our skies and reaches opposition on April the 8th. Not the biggest opposition that Mars can provide, that won't happen until later in the decade, but nonetheless this is Mars at its very best in a very long time. By a quirk of orbital mechanics, while opposition is on the 8th, meaning the Sun, Earth and Mars line up, 
Mars and Earth are actually at their closest six days later on the 14th, so the period immediately after opposition is going to be the best time. Now, what to look out for on Mars? Well, sticking with small scope views, I will mention four key features to look out for. The first is one of those features that makes Mars of such interest, the polar ice caps. A little white spot on the top or bottom, depending on your telescope, is a thick chunk of mainly frozen CO2. Now currently the north pole of Mars is orientated towards Earth, and the polar cap is not particularly extensive, as the north of Mars is at the height of summer presently. Northern Martian summer solstice was on February the 15th. Next is probably the most obvious feature on the Martian surface, and one very clear in even small and medium scopes, at opposition, Certus Major. Now the best way to describe this feature is a large dark triangle that points towards the north from the darker region of the south. It's actually a low relief shield volcano and the darkness is basalt. Now the only area that can cause confusion with Certus Major is the next area to mention, Chrysa Plantatia. Now this area itself is a lighter area around the equator between two darker regions that reach out from the north and south. The darker areas are often confused with Certus Major. The last feature is a side of Mars that does not appear to have much in the way of darker regions and makes Mars often appear uniform pink. This is the region usually referred to as Amazonius. It's a vast area with the volcano Olympus Mons to the north, which is the largest volcano in the solar system and can be seen in large scopes as a faint light patch. I do advise getting hold of a Mars map. There are some great ones on site such as the British Astronomical Association that will get you started and point you the right way. Moving on to the other planets, we have Venus getting lower in the pre-dawn sky, but it will now sit in approximately the same position for the next six months due to the relative orbital motions of Earth and Venus. Saturn, sitting in Libra, climbs slowly higher and is started to make its way into the late evening sky, finally becoming a decent target, though it is still very low for more northern observers. The rings are particularly well placed at the moment, so do take a look. Jupiter in Gemini is still very visible, but is beginning the slow retreat towards the Sun, so do go out and get a good last look at Jupiter, this apparition, before the King starts to battle with the evening glow. Mercury, Uranus and Neptune are not visible this month. The Moon this month gives us first quarter on the 7th at 9.31am, full Moon on the 15th at 8.42am, last quarter on the 22nd at 8.51am, and reach new moon on the 29th at 7.14am. This means the deep sky junkies should aim to get their fix at the beginning and end of the month, when the skies will be darker. The moon gives us some nice encounters over April, and on the 3rd sits in the Hyades cluster, while on the 6th the moon is next to Jupiter in Gemini. On the 14th, when it is almost full, it sits between Mars and Spica in Virgo. Saturn gets a visit on the 16th, while Antares is nearby on the 18th. Look out for the crescent moon with Venus on the 25th and 26th before dawn in what is always a beautiful pairing. For North American listeners, the moon puts on a real treat for you on the 15th and presents a total lunar eclipse for almost all of North America, the Pacific and the west coast of South America. Listeners in the northeast, such as Quebec and much of New England, will miss out on the full spectacle though. First contact with the penumbra will be at 0453 UT, with the first contact with the umbra, which will be the first real noticeable event occurring at 0558 UT. Totality will be between 0706 UT and 0824 UT, with the moon finally leaving the Earth's shadow at 1037 UT. Please remember to convert to your local time from these UT figures. Especially for those of us in other parts of the world, do please share your images and observations of this fantastic event on our Facebook, Twitter and Flickr groups. Fortunately for the meteor watchers, the moon is moving to last quarter, when the Lyrid shower belonging to comet Thatcher reaches its peak on the night of the 21st-22nd. It has a zenithal hourly rate of around 20 an hour, so it's a reasonable shower and worth the effort to spend some time looking at. It will be best late evening before the moon rises. For the deep sky challenge this month, we're going to look at the constellation Buertes and give you a multiple star splitting challenge, a globular cluster and a couple of nice galaxies. Buertes is a simple constellation, found by following the handle stars of the plough, and you'll find they roughly point to the star Arcturus. This is a bright star of magnitude minus 0.04, and sits at the bottom of the Buertes kite shape. Above Arcturus, towards Hercules, you should find the five stars that make a good pentagon. There are several good multiple star targets in Buertes, and this month we're going to point to you in the direction of five. The first is Epsilon Buertes, or Izar. This is a triple system, with the primary being a yellowy-orange magnitude 2.5 giant star. The secondary is magnitude 4.6 and a blue main sequence star, while the tertiary a magnitude 12. 
The primary and secondary are separated by 2.9 arc seconds. Next we have Mubuotis, which is another triple system with the primary appearing as a magnitude 4.3 blue-white star. The secondary initially appears as a magnitude 6.5, but is actually a close double star itself, with a primary of magnitude 7 and a secondary of magnitude 7.6. Our third multiple for you to split is Zeta Buetis. Now this is a physical binary combined with an optical companion, giving the appearance of a triple system. The physical binary are separated by one arc second and are mag 4.5 and 4.6. Meanwhile, the optical companion is separated by 99 arc seconds and is magnitude 10.9. Fourth, appropriately, is a four-star system for you to split, Xybuertes. This has a primary yellow star of magnitude 4.7 and a secondary orange star of magnitude 6.8, with a separation of 6.7 arc seconds. The tertiary is a magnitude 12.6 star and the quaternary is a scope straining magnitude 13.6. This group is actually close to Earth, just 22 light years away. Last is a binocular multiple, Nubuertes. This is a primary that is an orange giant of magnitude 5 and a secondary white star of magnitude 5. Splitting multiples is a test of scope prowess and skill with the eyepiece, so good luck and good hunting. Before leaving Buertes, it's worth mentioning three further deep sky objects for those that are not of a multiple persuasion. The first is a globular cluster, NGC 5466. This is one of the most difficult globs to observe and appears as a quite loose group for a glob. It has a low surface brightness of 9.1 and requires good skies and large apertures. Two interesting and reasonably bright galaxies to hunt down are NGC 5248 or Caldwell 45. A nice spiral is actually a member of the Virgo cluster. There is also NGC 5676 to look out for, another spiral famous for its fragmented and chaotic look. And don't forget you can also download our full Awesome Astronomy podcast for an hour-long show full of news, views, answers to your questions and interviews from around the astronomy world. It's available on the first of every month on iTunes and as an RSS feed as well as on our YouTube channel. You can also find tutorials, blogs, links to the show and Sky Guide on our website at www.awesomeastronomy.com. Good luck and we wish you clear skies. Clear skies.